hello everybody. Uh, thanks for giving me your time today. And uh, we'll go over a little bit of motion management with you. So during the, the talk, feel free to ask questions. I, I won't have you wait till the end. Hopefully I'll pay attention to the chat or Katie will help me, but feel free to ask if you have a question at any time. All right, so let's kick it off here. What we're gonna cover today is how is treatment affected by patient motion? It can be voluntary or involuntary. We'll go over some of, of what what those are, and then what do we do about it? How are we going to mitigate the movement? What can what's in our control? As you know, patient motion, if we have a 2D beam arrangement like we do on the left-hand side, that allows for some variation in the positioning. So if, if we see the blue here, this would be the body. Same thing over here on a 3D. So 3D is a little bit more conformal, meaning it's trying to really make the beams really tight against the tumor volume. So if we look at it in kind of a motion, We'll see here over in field one or the 2D, you know, if, if the patient moves a little bit, we can still hit the target. On 3D beam arrangement, when it's really conformal, and let me just do that one more time, we can see if the patient moves, we're going to treat, we're not going to treat what we want to. And then sometimes we might even treat things we don't want to, so our organs at risk. Same thing again in a 3D treatment, we know again that if we um, have the patient move around, we're going to miss the target. If we're talking about IMRT like we are over here on the right-hand side, sorry, whoops, technical errors, I apologize. <laughs> Trying to move my box over here. If we look, this one doesn't have animation, but you know, as we saw over there in the 3D with IMRT, if it is even more conformal than a 3D treatment, and then we're going to really miss the target if the patient moves, and then and we would also treat any organs at risk that we don't want to. And then we haven't accounted for too. That's the important part. So what types of patient motion are there? There's interfraction and there's intrafraction. So interfraction is variation in patient position from day to day. So from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday and so on. Interfraction is variation during the treatment. So it might be between AP treatment to the RAO. There's a, there's a difference in, in where the patient was positioned. So let's talk about, well, what are some of the variations? What ways can uh, the patient be positioned and it vary from day to day? Well, we can have variability in the patient positioning itself. So let's say we, we set the patient up in a, on the table and they're in perfect position. We move, we leave the room and they relax their arm or they relax, their, they're holding their pelvis really tight. They relax their pelvis. That's a variation in how they're, they're set up from day to day, or treatment field to treatment field. Also the organ variation. So let's say they they ate a big sandwich and their stomach is, is a little bit full and the digestion, you know, this is kind of a really big stretch, but their the digestion, maybe their stomach kind of relaxed, relaxed a little bit, their bowel moved so this, the sandwich down to their, through, to their different part of the bowel, something like that. That's all organ variation. Intervariation, that would be, what are some of those, those things? Well, that would be like, where's your position of your tongue? If you, you know, you have the tongue at the top of your mouth up against your hard palate, your larynx, let's say if you're swallowing a lot, you're, the patient might be nervous. There's, that's how they deal with it. They're swallowing a lot. The way their eyes are located, if they're looking up or looking down, or also one of the big things, and this is what we're going to talk a lot about today is respiration, right? So we can think about when we, when we take a big breath in, when we take a big breath out, we're moving organs all the time. Our lungs, we're moving our liver, we're moving our heart, our, let's see, we're, we're heart, or sorry, our lungs and our, our liver and, and things like that. We're moving those quite a bit when we, when we breathe in and out. Let's see, is there any questions here? Nope. All right. All right. So what are, when we, when we just stop and talk about interfraction, what are some of the ways that we can maintain consistency? So mobilization, we know that's a big one that we always, you know, 
treat, have to treat the patient in the same position all the time. We can tell, we can give the patient some preparation. We can say, please drink this amount of water. Please make sure that you are, your uh, bowels are empty. Don't eat so many hours before your treat. Things that are kind of out of our control is like the treatment planning. The physician will make appropriate margins to take into consideration. And this is kind of more so towards, I would say, the, the, the lung or respiratory treatment because um, they can take into consideration. And we'll go through this. What kind of margins we would put on maybe a lung um, tumor because the, we would know how the breathing affects where that tumor location is. And then we can also use image-guided radiation therapy or IGRT. So we can see from where the variation, where the, you know, where some of those factors have, of, are factoring into how we're treating a patient every day. So intrafraction, again, uh, what are some of the things that we can do to uh, manage that? So patient education, I think is a big one. We can explain to the patient what's happening. I always think about it this way. I think on the first day when they're simulated, they're nervous, you know, they're, they don't know what to expect. They've probably got, you know, they've seen three or four people by that time. And, and you know, they're, we've taken their clothes from them. We're telling them to lay on this cold, hard table. And we're doing a lot of stuff to them. So if you educate them and, and, and get them to understand what's happening to them, maybe to some degree, they can relax a little bit. With also with that, you know, the internet is a big, a big thing, and people will go and Google things, and in their mind, you know, they'll read something, and in their mind, they'll, they'll understand it one way, which could be the truth, and and sometimes it's not the truth. So you really need to educate and get them to to understand what we're doing to them and why it's important that they not move. When we talk about the tongue, you know, we can use a, a mouth device, a bite block, things of that nature, which help the tongue be in the position that the treatment is actually planned for. Larynx, another one, what we can do is tell them when to swallow, if this is of concern, if we're treating in that area, tell them what, what is exactly expected of them along with the eye. So if we're treating close to the orbital area and, and we want their lens to be out of the way, we could coach them on where to look during their treatment. And then the last one, resp respiration, again, is one that we're going to talk quite a bit about here today. And uh, we will talk about how we are using respiratory gating and a, a 4D technique. And for, for you, I'll just remind you, what is, what is a 4D technique? 4D means time. So we're, we're looking at the respiratory phases over time. So how's that patient breathing for that, uh, you know, five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever that they're, they're on the treatment table? We need to take that in consideration. So with respiratory gating, let's, let's take a look at this. So if we know nothing about the patient's respiratory motion, like we just are, so we take an image and we're assuming here. So this would be a, so this is AP. PA here, AP on the left, or anterior, posterior on the right, and then we're looking at right and left side. So if we just take an image, when we're assuming uh, this is their treatment, this is the tumor, our doctor would draw a margin around it to treat all the tumor, but we know nothing about actually what does it do when the patient is moving or breathing, what, what happens here? So with a 4D technique or the ability to capture this respiratory motion, we can see that this patient's tumor moves a lot when they're breathing. So this is kind of just a free breathing scan. We can see here um, that it doesn't necessarily look like they're taking big breaths in. We can see over here on the lower left side, we can see just the little bit of the tumor pop up in there. And the other thing I want you to look, to look at closely is you can appreciate that the tumor not only is moving superior inferiorly, but it's also got a little bit of a diagonal movement, if you can appreciate that. So we know that tumors don't always move linear. We can't just assume that it's going to only always go up and down or left and right. It's going to do all of it, kind of move in a circular motion. So we've got to take that in consideration. The other thing too to, to note is that maybe if this tumor was attached to the chest wall a little more, it would still move, but it may not move as much as something that's in the middle of the lung like this one or you know, not attached to, to any soft tissue. It might not move as much, but we still need to know what's going on with it. Uh, so keep in mind, we would, if we drew something like this, you know, what would the results be if we still treated with something like that? What would be the implications for the radiation treatment? 
I'll let you think about that for just one second. What, what, if we just drew it like that and we, what would, what would happen if we treated that? So we would not be treating some of the tumor, right? It would move out of the way for some part portion of the treatment. So we wouldn't be giving the, treat, the tumor the maximum amount of radiation that we wanna do. We would really have to do something like that in order to get it to be, you know, what we, what we wanna do. We wanna treat all the tumor, but with something like this, we're also treating healthy tissue, right? We're treating more of the lung for a little bit for the time that we may not want to. So that's why we want to use respiratory gating. So what we would want to do is we'd want to treat the tumor. So we'd beam on. And then when the tumor moved out of that treatment area because of the respiratory cycle, then we would beam on. And then we'd beam back on again when it got into the target area. And then we would beam off again. So we'll talk a little bit more about that respiratory gating here. What exactly does, what's involved with respiratory gating? We need to have some, some tools and, and equipment in order to do that. So two of the things that we need on the right-hand side is a camera. It's mounted on the wall. It's an infrared camera, so it emits light. Over here on the left-hand side are marker boxes that we use so that when the camera emits the light, these little dots on the marker box will reflect the light back to the camera. And then the camera captures what we call a signal. So that would be the, the respiratory uh, signal. And it, it tracks and analyzes the motion of the patient. So what's not on this, this slide is act the actual software that does that. So there are you know, different vendors who, who have different types of software that, that are out there. We'll go over that a little bit. I'll show you that. So these things are important. Where this tracker box is, is, is very important as well. We'll talk mostly about this one. This little one on, on the bottom is, is a type, I'm not familiar with that one, but it, I know that it's used, it's smaller. So it's probably, it's used more for breast treatments, things of that nature. This is, isn't, isn't a big uh, box, but it's still, you know, you, you can tell by the size, it has to have some sort of anatomy so it can sit on. Uh, so this one is, is more ad, ad, advantageous to uh, maybe smaller areas of treatment. So we'll look at this. Where, where should that marker box be placed? We'll see here it's on this patient's abdomen. What it is, is it's just a small plastic box. It's lightweight. The important thing is it has six different reflector dots on it on, on one side. So there, you've got to place it so that these reflector dots are facing the camera. Otherwise, it's not going to get a good read. And if it doesn't get a good read, then it's not, you're not going to be able to trace, trace the patient's respiratory phases. So important things, it has to be placed on the patient in a reproducible, reproducible fashion. So it can't be hanging off to the side. It can't, you can't just put it anywhere and say, okay, well, let's just put it on them. You can't, in this case, you wouldn't want to put it down on their, their pants or anything like that. And, it, and with that being said, it has to be done on the same position every single day. So we got to be specific about where we're putting it. We got to be able to put it in a, a fashion where the camera can see it and we're getting a good breathing trace. The things to keep in mind is maybe this particular patient um, is a belly breather. So if they are they use their um, belly more than their lungs, that's just how they breathe, then maybe not having it here would be a great idea. Some people are, are big chest breathers. They're taking in big breaths and, and you know, this isn't fixed on the patient. You know, we don't uh, necessarily do anything to fix it there. So you got to keep in mind that how are they breathing? And then that goes back into the teaching part. It's, you need to tell the patient, this is going to be on you. So you're going to have to breathe normal, but not, you know, don't get, don't breathe really heavily or anything like that. So what kinds of respiratory gating are there? We're going to talk about phase gating and we're going to talk about amplitude gating. So phase gating is when the beam, the radiation beam is activated in certain phases of the cycle. So once we track the patient's respiratory cycle, you know, they get a sim and they're laying there with the block on their abdomen and we do a scan and then we, we 
the software looks at their, their gating phase. So we'll know when they take in an inspiration, when they take in an expiration. So we take uh, and look at the phases of the breathing. Amplitude is when we take, when the radiation beam is activated in a certain threshold, if you will. So, you know, they're going to be free breathing. And it, it, per the doctor's prescription, he may say, I want um, a, this patient treated within this, this threshold of their breathing cycle, meaning they're not taking in a big breath or they're not taking, taking out an, a big exhale. They're just kind of, I want them treated when they're in the middle of the two of them. So based on the imaging, we maybe that's determined that the, the tumor that we're trying to treat doesn't move that much during that certain threshold. And that's when we will want the beam to be turned on. This is just a picture of what the kind of the software would look like. This would be, this isn't the best picture here, but the software, when you're treating the patient, this is where you would monitor, you know, that box. And this would be more of their, their anatomy. You would actually see the patient here. So it's kind of like a patient camera. Over here, the, the most important part is, is we're going to talk about this area down here. And we're not talking about the software itself. We're just talking about what's happening when we're treating, we're using respiratory gating. So as you can see here, this is how that camera and the, the dot marker box would capture the phases of breathing. So inspiration, expiration, inspiration, expiration. And then this dial over here kind of tells you this patient uh, will take in a breath for about one and a half seconds and they'll, ex they'll let the breath out for about three seconds. So they're, they're a little bit longer in their expiration. Over here would just be what your patient's name is and, and so on. But this, this little box is what, what's going to control when the beam is on and when the beam is off. So we're ha having the software help us in, in, in turning the beam on and turning the beam off. Well, we're just going to take a quick closer look at that little area. So in this case, we can see that when the patient breathes out expiration, that's when we're going to, the beam will be turned on and then the beam will turn off when they take their breath in. So we're not, we're, we've coached the patient on how to breathe, you know, just breathe normal because that's how we've captured them that first day of sim. So we're, we're counting on them to breathe in that normal fashion and that they're, Inspiration, expirations will always be, you know, in this case, this is, you know, super consistent. I don't think this would be a normal person's breathing. Maybe if they're sitting watching TV or, or doing something like that, but certainly not probably during treatment or on the day of sim. But the point here is that the beam is on when in certain either breathing in or breathing out. So that certain phase of their breathing. With amplitude gating, Again, this one is one where we're going to set a threshold. So this blue line and this yellow line are the threshold that we want the beam to be on. So we tell the system that during this certain phase of, of breathing, their, the breathing amplitude, we, we set a, a threshold. So as you can see here, this is as when they start, this right here is in, so the beam would be on as they get, okay, you know, go up to the top here and take in a bigger breath that's outside of that threshold so the beam would be turned off. Then they go back in here and breathe. And then this one just slightly off and so on. So we can kind of see how this is, you know, more or less a way that a patient would treat, be treated or breathe is they're going to go outside of that a little bit. And keep in mind, all of this is based on what we see, what the doctor prescribes for treatment and what we see when the patient in that, in that CT sim, how we collect the data. So amplitude gating, this is kind of similar to what we just saw, but look here, this is the upper threshold that we would set, and this is the lower threshold we would set. So um, it narrows a little bit of where uh, the beam would be turned on. And then we can see here that versus what I showed you with the phase breathing, they were pretty, you know, beam on was and beam hold were, were pretty consistent in the, the shape of or the time frame. This one is a little, just a little bit longer, maybe on the beam hold because of that threshold. We're not looking at it all the way up here. This is another example of uh, kind of a, an extreme, if you will. Um, this is free breathing. So notice how this threshold is, is wide open. 
This would be what we would want to maybe set. We're using gating, but we're not actually that concerned about the threshold of, of inspiration or expiration. However, we do want the beam to maybe turn off if the patient coughs. So if the cough, you know, it would go. So if you're coughing, you're ex expiring. So down in here, maybe it'd go way down here. The beam would turn off because they coughed. Uh, maybe they yawned or something like anything that it would affect their breathing. We could set an extreme type of, of amplitude or threshold that would turn the beam off if they if they did that. So without gating, you know, we're at the LINAC and we we're monitoring our patient. The beam is on and they cough uncontrollably. Most of the time, we don't have time to hit that off button because they've already coughed by the time we we are there. So this gating will help. Uh, alleviate that it, it does that it turns that beam off for us now we'll just take a quick look at a picture here if you notice that these are fiducials there they have been contoured with some green and we'll see it over here this will be where the beam turns on and the beam turns off and we'll we'll see the amplitude of the the way the respiration is of the patient so in, inhalation exhalation and then this is the little blue and the yellow lines that have been set for the threshold. So this is amplitude gating, we can see that. So let's turn it on and we'll notice this patient is breathing. So whenever those fiducials line up to where it's been planned, the beam will turn on. When the patient is breathing normal, so when it goes out of, of range, it, the beam will turn off. Yellow is beam on, the white is, is beam off. So we'll see. You know, this is, is the patient is, is respiring in a normal fashion and the beam is controlling when it is turning on or the software is help, helping us turn the beam on and turn the beam off when it's out of, out of sync with what we want to treat. This is just another example. You now, I've, this isn't my slide, but I apologize. There's a stent here. There's a lot of, lot of contours going on here. So there's a stent here. And there's also fiducials in this little green area here. And this is just another example of what happens when the, the stent and the fiducials are in line. Now note, we can see this is moving uh, around the patient. We'll see the gantry move a little bit. So kind of get a better idea of what's going on. We're not seeing motion. We're just, on this case, we're just seeing, uh, it's, not, it's not showing us motion that much, but it would, you know, we can see where the angles of the gantry are moving. And then we can also appreciate here how the breathing pattern is and when the beam is on. So note how, you know, in this is in the whole threshold here, and that's why the beam is on for that long versus maybe this one, this one isn't as long as the one we just saw. So it does it, it turns the beam on and off. The software will help us turn the beam on and off. So how about respiratory motion when we treat a breast? Over here on the left-hand side, the red line represents the actual field edge. So as we know, when we treat breasts, we want to, we have to treat some of the lung, but we want to reduce the amount of lung that we, we treat. So we want to include all the breast tissue with, with the minimal amount of lung tissue that we can have. With deep breath or with breast treatment as well, if we have left side, we know that the, the, when the patient breathes, this, this heart could move into the treatment field. They could take in a deeper, they've had a heart, you know, they're, they're in maybe anxious or something. They take in a deep breath or expire, take in a, let out their breath. The heart will go into the, the treatment field. So to mediate that, what we can do to hold, to reduce the amount of cardiac toxicity, toxicity or the amount of heart that goes into the treatment field, we can have them take in a deep um, inspiration breath hold. So that's what this is uh, called. So that way, when they take in a big breath, it, hold their breath deep, then that heart will move out of the treatment field. And we can see that by this picture here. So with that breath hold, we can see here that this is kind of what it would look like on that software. So we can see here how they're taking in a breath and they're holding it. And within this area, as long as they're within this threshold that we set, the beam will be on. We can see that here. And then they'll let their breath out. Uh, so for breast treatment, that, that's pretty, you know, someone can hold their breath for that long. If we're treating maybe a very advanced IMRT treatment of the lung, maybe this isn't 
something that they can hold for that long. So again, it goes back to, we're gonna talk a little bit, just a little bit, touch a little bit more later in this presentation, but you remember, you gotta teach the patient what they're doing during this treatment so that they know what's expected of them and that it makes their treatment a lot smoother so that they'll understand uh, what's happening. With breath hold as well, let's say the patient takes in too big of a breath. See here, it's outside of that, that threshold. So we can see down here, it only beam only turned on for a minute or two or a second or two, and then it turned off because they're outside of it. And then once they get back into that range, it might turn on a little bit and then whoop, they're out, out of the range and then it, it, it turns on, turns off. Uh, so not really a smooth treatment. Patient, <clears throat> excuse me, could need a little more coaching or something's happening that day with their breathing. They're, they're having a certain, some sort of issue that day. You know, we'd go in there and, and make sure that we understand what's happening. Down at the end here, we can notice that the patient, you can assume here that the patient is maybe leaking out some air or something like that. I've had patients who you, you've coached them and you've told them what's expected of them, but they've learned that they can kind of sneak out, leak, I guess is a good word, leak out a little bit of their breath out of the side of their mouth or something so that they feel comfortable that they're, they're still breathing. You know, I'm still in control of my breath, but this is what will happen. This is kind of like a, a leaking of their breath. So if they leak, then we can see here, oh, you're outside of the range. Then you would, you'd go back and you'd say to the patient, when you're, are you holding your breath? Are you are you leaking out a little bit of breath while we're treating? We, we can find out exactly what the patient is doing based on what this gating or this amplitude, the thresholds are telling us. So let me just stop for one, one second. I know I'm, I'm spitting out a lot of information to you. I'll give you guys a second. Are there any questions right now or, or are we good? And I, I, know I don't expect you to answer, but if, if you have a question, please feel free to just... Let me know real quick. Or it looks like nothing in the queue. Okay, good. All right, let's move on then. So we're going to talk a little bit about details for the therapist. We're, we'll go over this in the next section a little bit more, but this is kind of what the agenda is for treatment. Make sure that you understand how the equipment works. And by that, I mean, if you're setting a threshold or if the threshold has been set and you're going to treat in that area, you need to understand what exactly does that mean? How am I going to use that? And then in simulation, we're going to we're going to understand a little bit more about a scanning, like how what it what does it mean to use gating with scanning? And then how are we going to what patients are we going to use it on? Is everybody a candidate for for being used for using gating? And then what are we going to do when we train them? What are we what should we do? So treatment considerations. This is a picture of this would be a lateral isofilm for a breast. This is the, the matching window here. So kind of just ignore that for a second. If this was a breath hold, a left breast breath hold, because we want to reduce the heart in the treatment field. If we are matching this from a, the DRR to the lateral ISO we took, so this is pre-treatment images. Here is the line for the lung or the uh, spine. We want to match the spine up and we also want to match the sternum up. So in this case, if we were doing this, we would assume that they are matching up and we're good to go. If we were to take this field and we weren't, we weren't matched up. So this would be, you know, the patient is breathing. We took, took pre-treatment fields and we notice, whoops, let's just assume because I don't have a different image that the, the sternum went way out over here. So we're not matched up. We've got their breathing is different than what we're expecting it to be. So now if we didn't have gating and we're matching this, we would have to decide which one of these are we going to take priority over the spine? Or are we going to take priority over the sternum? We're going to have to decide how, how are we going to move the patient or how, what are we going to do to, to make up for this? But with gating, we could just adjust that breath hold threshold and, and we could ask the patient to take a deeper or a shallower breath so that we could adjust the gating properly. So without imaging, or, um, or sorry, with, with imaging and no gating, we'd have to prioritize. But, but thankfully with, with gating, then we could, we could move that threshold so that we knew when the beam should be on based on the way that patient is breathing. If you don't mind, we do have two questions. Okay, so let's address those. It says, can you please tell us the difference between phase gating and amplitude gating? So again, the difference between phase breathing 
is when you're doing that, you're, the machine will turn on in a certain phase of the respiratory gating cycle. So when you would, the beam would turn on when your doctor, when the location of the tumor is in a certain phase of that breathing. So, so in inspiration or expiration, that's when the beam would turn on. So when we watch the, the phase of the breathing, it would be in, in that area. Amplitude is, is, it doesn't, it will only turn, it's activated, the beam is activated whenever the threshold value is re, um, reached, regardless of what phase it, it's, regardless of what phase of breathing it's in. So let me see if I can go back to a previous field here real quick. Let me just see if I can end the show. Sorry, I'll get back there. It's easier just to go backwards here and show you guys. All right, like you can see my screen here. Uh, this is phase breathing. So see, we are going to turn the beam on only when they're in, breathing out. We're gonna hold the beam when they're breathing in. So we determine what the phase is based on our SIM scan, and that's when the beam goes on and off. So in amplitude gating, this is the phase here or the threshold here, I should say. So it doesn't necessarily matter where the beam is turned on or what phase of breathing they're in. We would just turn the, the beam would just be turned on during this certain threshold that we, we put on. So if we look at the previous, previous example here, the beam hold is, is kind of a larger area than maybe, uh, these are kind of the same, these are kind of the same example here, but you know, the, in some of these other examples, this one, this, this might be the best, best way to look at it. Notice this is breathing in and out, in and out, the inhalation, exhalation, but the threshold is large enough that it won't turn the beam off regardless of whether they're, they're breathing in or out. So this is what amplitude gating is. If we were to um, just turn the beam on and off in, the, in expiration, then it would turn off in these it would turn on and off in these valleys, peaks and valleys of the breathing cycle. Hopefully that, that under, you understand that a, a little bit better. Can, we, can it be found on the same equipment? Yes, it, you don't have to switch equipment. It's all just how you set that threshold, if you will. Also for a person that may be suffering from some kind of breathing issues or, or, the, or, or how do you handle that? That would be, what you would do is, is you would determine that at the time of sim. You know, if someone can't lay flat without coughing, they wouldn't be a good candidate for for gating. They're maybe they're super anxious and they just they can't they can't stand it. They can't stand being breathing a certain way that they need to. Then they wouldn't be a very good candidate. Those are things that you work with with your probably physicist, your dosimetrist, your your team. You know, your doctor, and you guys all decide that whether or not they're good candidates for gating or not. Maybe after a few treatments and their, their breathing improves, they're, they're being, for example, with a lung, you know, maybe their tumor is compromising their breathing. Maybe after a, a week or two of treatment, maybe then they do become a better candidate because they're breathing better for gating. Then, then that might be something where you resim them again and use the gating technique. When you turn on the, here's another question. When you turn on the radiation beam, there's always a time lag between beam on and the actual radiation on. How does that affect treatment using gating? So this software is turning that beam on and off for you. So it should be pretty real time. That's what the software is called. It's real time. So it should be instantaneous. It's, it takes that use that, that leg out a little bit, I think of hitting the button or, or whatnot. I honestly, that, that, that's kind of like a generic answer for you. I know that there is an actual little bit of leg time, but, but again, with the software being right there, real time, it, it should mediate any lack of, of beam on beam off. Let's see. Can the use of gating be imp imp improvised, assuming it doesn't come along with the equipment, especially when you when your machine or has facilities for IMRT and C CBCT? I'm sure, you know what I have done in the clinic before is we we used to call it a poor man's gating. We didn't have the, the equipment to necessarily do gating, 
but you would coach the patient, you know, taking a really deep, deep breath and hold it. We would do that when we scanned and then we'd say, take a really big breath out and hold it out. And then we'd scan them. So if you're doing that when you're doing simulation, you've got to have a pretty fast scanner in order to capture the patient before they pass out or have to take another breath. If you're doing that during treatment, the same thing, you've got to make sure that the treatment doesn't take a long period of time that they can actually breathe in or out on your instruction and, and hold in that position and hold that, that breathing phase during their treatment themselves. One more question. How do you take port images when using gating technique or, or others to match with the CT image? You know, the idea behind this presentation, we're not going to get into the nuts and bolts of that. We're just, get, we're, we're just going with concepts right now. I don't, I don't really, the, what the equipment that I'm showing you is, is Varian and this isn't vendor specific talk at all. I'm used to talking about Electa. I've used Electa equipment. So I, I'm not going to address that, that how you take that port image during the gating technique right now, because that's just, that will be for another, another time. We're just, we're just going over the concepts and, and what does this mean when we, when we take an image and, and how would we do that kind of thing? We're not going into how, how do you set the threshold? What, where are those numbers at? That type of thing. So I'm sorry. I, I, I don't really I'm not going to, I don't know how to answer that question really, really well right now. Next question is, so once we simulate with the respiratory gating software or some system software system, does that mean the system is part of the treatment execution system as we treat the patient? Yes, it is. So if you sim and at the end of this, uh, this um, presentation, we'll, I'll show you a little bit of a picture of that. We'll talk a little bit about that. But when you simulate someone with the respiratory, that will be part of the treatment. If for some reason, if you, if you go into it and the doctor and you determine, well, this patient is kind of iffy. I'm not sure if they're going to be able to breathe in the fashion that we ask them to. We've, got, we've captured all the, thing, all the information we need to, to treat them gated. But let's say they can't do that. Then we could, there's also other scans that may be done. So you may be doing a free breathing scan, just a plain old CT sim, a free breathing scan. You, you might be doing these, these respiratory gating scans at the same time. There, there might be several different scans that you do while the patient's being simulated. First of all, for, for the doctor and your physicist or dosimetrist to figure out exactly what the tumor volume is, but also, you know, kind of as understanding of how they're breathing for gating. And then it can be just a free breathing scan so that you can use that for, for just regular treatment planning without any of these extra devices or whatnot. Okay, those are the questions. Let's see if I can close this. Hopefully that answers your question. If it doesn't, at the end, let's address it again. Say that doesn't make sense to me. Let's talk about it again. All right, so this is, we talked about this. So this is, this is what, what I was saying. If, if, this, if this in your pre-treatment imaging, you know, orthogonal, this is probably just a plain old image. If this sternum is out of whack due to breathing, then we would ask the patient to change their, their breath hold. This is another picture here of what it might look at, look like. So this is IGRT image guided. So this would be a uh, treatment picture that we take. So what we're looking at is A. So let's talk about this. What would happen if we would take a, a film in this area, around this area that the patient is, is breathing versus where this where they're breathing here? So if we talk about A, around the image taken around that green area, arrow, we notice that it's really not consistent. They're not consistent in the way that they're breathing. It may be within that threshold, but it's not really consistent. So if we took an image, one image in time during that air in this area, we may decide that we need to move the patient. So if we go back to, to looking at that lateral view of the breast, it, let's say that, that the sternum was out of whack. We would say, oh, we need to maybe, because the patient is still in the breathing, you know, it still looks good, maybe we would bump the table up or bump the table down. That it, it's, it, we would adjust the table but really we might not need to. If we took an image here of when the patient is in more of a consistent breathing cycle, then, then you know, we, would, we would know when the, the, that the patient is in the position that we need to have them in so that we can treat them properly. 
So the take home message of this, the key point of this is just you, your images need to be representative of, of your treatment, where are you going to put the patient in treatment. One thing that maybe I didn't mention or isn't clear is that these thresholds can be moved based on what where you think the patient is. So where you think the patient is, is based on your images you take. So if the patient is here, my threshold is great, right? I don't really need to move it. If the patient, if I took an image in here and I determined that the, the sternum was out of, out of line, I might move the threshold. I might bump the patient up a little bit. I might, and that, and that would, again, move the, th if I bump the patient up and the patient was, was breathing, just they, they changed their breathing, then maybe the amplitude would be outside here because they bumped the patient up. So you just need to be consistent in, or you need to, to take, have an image that's representative of what is actually going on. I think that, that that to me, if I step back and I go, that's confusing. Like I'm not under, I'm not understanding that. The point of that, these aren't these these slides were made for me. And I was when I was doing this, this preparing for this talk, that that confused me as well. So let me let me just step back for a second with this one and, and, and maybe just, just say to you that the whole message behind this again is just to know what exactly is going on with your patient. So you, just knowing, and maybe we'll go over this in, in, in a couple of slides, slides, there'll be kind of an example that might bring this to light, but just know that what this, what this image is, what this slide is, is intending to tell you is that we just need to know when we're taking the image and what, what it's representing to us. So we may have to say, well, I might need to take the image again. I'm not going to adjust my threshold because I don't feel like that is a good indication of what my, how, how the patient is breathing versus this one uh, B. So you might just retake the image again and see what it looks like instead of moving the, the table or the patient position. Because if, again, if you move the table, then they could be outside of this threshold and then the beam would be turned off. Or you might move the threshold and then you really wouldn't be treating the patient in the correct position because the beam would be turned off or on in the area where the tumor isn't. Okay, so let's talk about next. Make sure you understand how the equipment works. What are the implications? So we're gonna talk about today or right now is like the camera itself is mounted on a wall. So it's looking at these little dots in the block that's on the patient. So it's always in, this camera is always in a stationary position. And so we set the patient up based on their tattoos and their, their position on the table. So we know where it is. What would happen then if we moved, if, if the tracing, the breathing trace that, that we, we just looked at and, but sorry, the pole launched. What would happen to the breathing trace if the treatment couch moved vertically higher by half a centimeter after you match the imaging? So that we think about that, what I just showed you, if we looked at that and we said, oh, the patient are on our film, we need to bump the table up a little bit so that the, based on what we see on the image, that the breathing cycle is within our threshold, we'll bump the table up. So that's all answer the, the poll. It says uh, exactly what I asked you. What would happen to the breathing trace if the treatment couch was moved, bumped up uh, vertically uh, higher by a half a centimeter? Would the breathing trace go lower by half a centimeter? Would it go higher by half a centimeter? Or would there be no effect on the br breathing trace at all? So kind of we'll look here. Yep, what would happen? So about, I'm not sure if you guys can see this poll or not, but it looks like by quite a bit of advantage, the patient's breathing trace would go lower. That's what people think. So let's, let's look at it here. So if we bumped up the table, remember that box is going to bump up as well, right? So the patient's breathing cycle would go up higher by half a centimeter as well. So this is what we would see. So this would be outside. Notice how this area here is larger than this area here. So we would be treating longer than we intended to. The beam would be on, 
for a longer period of time than it would be here. So we have to understand, and this is why, why it's in that understand your, your, how to use the equipment, is when you bump up the treatment or bump up the table, then maybe that amplitude gating threshold would also, the trace would also bump up a little bit higher. So the machine would be turned on, the beam would be on longer than you really, what the intent was, what it was planned for. So those of you who thought it would go lower, so this yellow line would be down lower, is there, uh, is it something more than I can explain or is it, it's kind of one of those things that you have to be, you have to work with the software, I think, to understand this. But the, the, the take home concept here is that you just have to understand what happens if I bump the patient up, what's gonna to happen to my actual, when, when will the beam turn on and off based on my, my threshold? Do I need to change my threshold? Do, is just moving the patient, is, going, is that gonna be uh, sufficient in order to still treat? There are all, all sorts of things that you have to think about and take into consideration. Okay, so with breath hold as well, what happens, same thing, if, what happens if you image match and change the patient's position vertically? Same thing will happen here is that if I were to bump up the table, I, sorry, why is this matching what I'm saying? If I were to bump up the table, then I could be outside of my threshold. So what you would need to do is go back to, to not moving the table, but going back to the breathing itself and, and seeing how that is relative to the camera. And you need to kind of retract the breathing after the couch shift because the patient is now they, they, they've changed, right? So if you move the table based on what you're seeing with the images, then you, you need to adjust your, your threshold accordingly. This is another example of that. So what happens if you image match and, and you change the patient's position, then you also need to understand where your threshold is at. So if we bumped up the patient, then our threshold, our, our breathing cycle bumped up again. We might need to ret retract, or re retract the breathing cycle and then move our thresholds if we need to. So SIM, SIM considerations. I just said a few times there that the camera is mounted on the wall. <clears throat> but now during simulation, the camera is not mounted on the wall. It's mounted on the table. And the reason for that is because the table is going through the scanner with the patient. So this is when we treat, we're not moving the table in and out, but during SIM, we're moving the table to, to acquire the images, the table moves in and out. <clears throat> so the camera is mounted on the table uh, and that's just the difference. So this will be slightly different than what you see in the, in the, the actual treatment room. So the other things about simulation, um, consideration is, is what is a 4D CT? I talked a little bit earlier and I said, what is 4D? 4D just is, can, can, takes into consideration time. So it's breathe, the breathing cycle over time. So we're, we're, we're taking a scan that with the use of the camera and the fiducial block, we can determine what the, how the patient is breathing over those few minutes that we're, we're scanning them. So the system has software, it can put them into specific bins, if you will, that's what they're called. So certain bins of the breathing cycle. So inspiration will know how long they're in inspiration, will know how long they're in expiration based on how the scan is taken. Sometimes again, there's multiple scans done so that just what the physician orders and what they want. So they can compare the anatomy of, of you know, where the patient, where that the tumor is. So for example, you can do the expiration breath hold, inspiration breath hold. You can do this 4D. So they're just breathing normal, but the, the camera is, is, is tracking what the breathing cycle is. We can do a free breathing scan where there's no extra software. It's just capturing breathing of the patient. So there's all sorts of scans that we can take so that the doctor and the team can determine what the location of the tumor is how it can be treated and the, and the organs at risk, no matter where the, where the tumor is located, the organs at risk dose is at a minimum. Important things too is patient screening. Like, like I said before, if they're unable to lay flat without coughing, 
if they have all sorts of other things that that are into play that day of their scan, that they're not going to be reproducible or you're not going to be able to get a, a very good um, signal from them. Those are things that would be part of the screening that you wouldn't do. You would, they wouldn't be a candidate for gating. Education at time of sim, those things too, you have to educate the patient. And one thing that comes to mind about education is that, you know, sometimes the power of suggestion is, is, is not to your advantage. So, you know, you, you have to be careful with suggestion to patients too. It's like when you're holding your breath, don't try to leak out any, any breath while you're, while you're, you're laying there. So what I mean by that is if you suggest to a patient not to do that, they might do it anyway, because you've, you've already, they, they, they may not have thought about that. They might go, oh, I'm just going to leak out some breath and I can hold my breath longer. So things like that, you got to keep in, in, in mind when you, when you sim the patient and when you tell them what's going to happen. I think if they understand what you're doing, why you're doing it, then they're more apt to comply with what their part of the whole thing is. This is just an example, again, of what there, there's another method out there and it's called um, Vision RT. What that does is this patient laying on the table here is, doesn't have any tattoos. So when the, the therapist line this patient up, they're using this information over here to val validate or verify where the patient, if the patient is in treatment position properly. So these are thresholds that are set as well. So this, if this was red way out over here, we would know that we'd need to bring our vert up a little bit higher um, or lower, we, one or the other. We would see what all of this information is. If they were twisted, like maybe the right side was twisted up. If they were, let's say they're in a backlock bag and they didn't lay down all the way in it, they kind of, or they had a wallet in, in their bottom part, you know, they pulled their pants down, but they have a big giant wallet and it's still in part of the vac lock bag, which pushes their leg up a little bit and they're rolled slightly, then this would help, you know, indicate to the, the therapist that something isn't quite right. We need to twist the patient. We need to find out what, maybe they're not relaxing. We need to find out why, why we're not positioning the patient properly, all without tattoos. So on this, vision, this view here, it takes a topographical um, image of the patient and it will show you if something's out of whack here. So we can see here that this lady's arm is a little bit higher than what is expected. So we would just adjust her arm down a little bit to get her into proper position. Now, again, this is you know something that you may ask, what, how do I take an image here as well? This is just, just introduction. I don't, I'm not, I don't know anything about Vision RT other than what I just explained to you. So it's just, it's just for you guys to understand that, yeah, there are other things that we can do. Um, to mediate, mitigate patient movement. And then with this, this software itself as well, they can use it as gating. They can use it to determine how the breath is. This, this may go out of line because the patient's breathing quite a bit. This can be used to gate the patient as well. So just kind of a little introduction. And if you wanted to, re, to know more about it, you can go to their website and, you know, it's, it, Vision RT, I know, is, is quite popular anyway in the States. They use it in multiple centers. And again, the biggest advantage is patients aren't getting tattoos. And so they really, really, really like that. Key points, as we're at the last of our talk here, key points. You want to minimize your positioning as much as possible. And we all know that. I've gone over that several times. I know you've had other talks about mobilization and whatnot. Again, the biggest thing that I really, really am an advocate of is, is educating, preparing your patient on what to expect, what, what's expected of them. Methods to address intrafraction. So what is the intrafraction? Remember, is it is it day to day? Is it from Monday to Tuesday? Or is it from AP to P? Intrafraction is, is the during the treatment, what, what are we what are we doing to to possibly reduce the amount of, of positioning variation that can happen? So things, of course, the doctor based on the scans, based on all the stuff, would give us a appropriate PTV. So if the long tumor is moving out of of it's moving left and right and 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 sideways, it's moving in that circular pattern, then they would know to give you an appropriate PTV. So that would take, that would be something that we could do to mitigate the, the movement and treat what the 
all the tumor with very little of the organs at risk. Again, pa patient participation. I think I've talked a lot about that. And then the other way we can do it too is respiratory gating, which goes back up to the appropriate PTV. If the patient is able to do respiratory gating, we'll get the appropriate scans and then we'll be able to, uh, to handle and understand what the pretreatment images is and how we could either coach the patient on their breath or move the table, those types of things. With any new technology, we just all need to make sure we understand how it works and how to use it. So with that, if you again, if you're interested in, in Vision RT and how it works, you can go to their website. If you're interested in knowing a little bit more about left breast hold, there's a journal article that is recommended for you to take a look at. For your homework next time, as Katie said, here's an article on, I think, was it radiation safety? I think it was an art article for you guys to review before your next meeting. And then this this presentation or the slides were developed by these folks at Stanford. So we'll give them a shout out for, for giving us some good information. And that, my friends, is the end of my talk. I do see there are a couple questions. So let me let me let me look at them. One question is: I mean, repeat your first two seconds introduction where you mentioned next week and other instructions. I think that I think that's for Katie to talk about, maybe. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that copy and paste. As a reminder, we have a learning from each other discussion later this month. And for those that would like to talk about their transition to IMRT, I will include a link to a survey in the chat box. Also, as Carrie mentioned, we have a reading assignment on radiation safety. And I've also put in the chat box the, the link to the New York Times article that we encourage you to read ahead of time. Thank you. Great, thanks. One last question, as expected, as someone said they didn't under, quite understand that IGRT with gating. Can you summarize it? All right, so in summary, the point of that whole thing is, is if you are, so when you're setting up gating, you would, Put the box on the patient and you would use the software to track to to get a reading of of the patient so let me do this real quick so i'm going to end the show and i'll get back i'll show it to you one more time so if we go back to the software where it is let's see i think you can still see my you can still see my my show. So this, this would be the patient lays down we put the box on them it's facing the camera that's mounted on the wall so we turn on this, this real-time respiratory gating system, and we get a trace of the breathing cycle here. So we see it, and we're like, great, looks, let's take an image. We need to see, we need to, it's time to do our orthogonal films. We need to see what's going on here. So if we take an image and we, just, and, and we decide, let's say it's a, the breast patient again, and we see the image and we go, whoa, looks like their, their sternum is way, way out of whack. We need, they need to change change the way they're breathing. So if we were to take, we took an image and we decided uh, it's, not, it's not ideal. There's something's wrong. Either the patient is positioned incorrectly, they're breathing incorrectly, or maybe you know, we need to, to do something about that. So you could go, you could say, I'm gonna bump the table and then we'll go ahead and just treat. If you don't evaluate it and you say, wait, wait a second. If we bump the table up, then they're breathing is going to, and we don't do anything about that threshold I set, then their breathing is going to be out of the threshold and the beam is going to be turned on or off, maybe a little bit different than what was planned. So you need to decide, all right, do, what do we need to do? Should we just re-image? I think it's because the patient is breathing differently. Let's go back into the room. Let's tell them, don't take in as big a breath as you, as you, you did last time. Just kind of, you know, if you remember how you breathe, don't take in as big a breath. And then you image again, and you're like, oh, that's better. That, that's what we expect. So the point of that whole IGRT thing is to say, all right, guys, when you're taking images, don't just jump to the conclusion that oh, I got to bump the table up. You got, there's a lot of factors in there. And that's what it, why it was called know, know how to use the equipment. It's like, is, is the patient breathing as they normal, as we instructed them to? We got to figure that one out. 
is if they aren't, then what is the answer? Are we gonna bump the table up and move our threshold or are we gonna go back in there and say, um, how are you doing today? Are you know, are, are you, do you feel like you're breathing normal? Do you, are you anxious today or something? Did you, do you feel like you took in a big extra breath? Those are kind of things that you need to think about instead of just making changes without really taking all of the, the factors into consideration. So hopefully that, that you, you understand it a little bit better. I hope it's it, the point of the whole thing again, is just to, to, to think about everything bef and to understand that one, if you make one change, it, it has a chain reaction of, of changing a lot of things at the same time. All right, everybody, that is the end of my talking today. I hope it helped you understand a little bit more about patient motion management and gating. Gating is, again, is one of those things that you, when you decide to do gating, the software representative will come and teach you all of these things about how to use that software. And, and hopefully this is just a little taste of, of what it is and how it can be used.